Good day, everyone. It's great to be back with you, and we're carrying on with Revelations chapter three. I'm kind of excited now because we're getting into the, the the second chapter, and we're working through with seven churches. But also, what this really means for you and for me, and what we can learn from it, and how we can move forward in the things that God's got for us. So, Revelation. Remember this oh, oh, nice little uh, cover there for you. In chapter 1, we came across this verse. It says in verse, chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Write the things, write therefore the things that you have seen, those things that are, and those things that will take place after this. This is John's outlining of the book of Revelation. This is what Jesus told him to write down. Write the things that you have seen. That was a picture, the vision of the glorified Jesus. This is when he goes through the whole different aspects of what he was wearing, what it was like, and that's John, that's the things that you have seen. The things that are, well to John the things that are are the seven churches, which is what he's going to be writing to in the next two chapters. And then from chapter four onwards, those things that take place after this. Metatarta is the Greek phrase there, and we'll find in chapter four that that phrase pops up again, the things thereafter. But it's that little bit in the, these things, those things that are, that I want to concentrate on. Verse 11, we, we read this. Write what you have seen in a book and send it to the seven churches. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamon, to Typhida, to Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. Now please don't laugh with me, because every now and then I'm going to pronounce these names slightly different or get them completely wrong. So do bear with me as we go to it. But John was asked to write to these seven churches. Now there are some scholars that actually believe that when it says to the angel or to the messenger, some actually believe that the, the pastors from these seven churches actually came to Patmos where John was. And the seven stars that Jesus was holding, holding his hand were those seven pastors. And um, he wrote to them and gave, it to the letters, gave them the letters and they took it back with them. For each of the seven churches got an individual letter, which we will go into the Ephesians um, shortly. But then he gave them the entire book. So each church read what Jesus said about each other. Now that's okay in one sense, that if Jesus says something quite positive to us as a church, we might want people to know about. But if he says something that wasn't too good, some of us might just want to keep it quiet. But to these seven churches, they found out what Jesus said to all the churches. And he actually told them to, to write in a book and then send it, send it off. So the book of Revelation was the book, but in each book they had a little section that was to the individual churchmen to learn from it. So to seven letters to the seven churches. Now each of these seven letters had seven parts, which not be surprised in Revelation. Everything's about sevens. And we'll cover the first one. It, the first one is actually a title of Jesus. Now this is quite amazing because each title that we go through, each of the letters has a title of Jesus. And we'll find that title comes from chapter one. It's mentioned in the church in a certain way. And it's also mentioned from chapter four onwards. So this is talk about Jesus. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the golden lampstands. To the next church he actually said this. These are the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. The words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. That's an interesting one because he's going to get on about the word of God there. The words of the Son of God whose eyes are like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. We kind of really don't understand the idea of that, but bronze and fire, fire talks about judgment, that Jesus is the holy God, but yet he's also a just God. And to the next one, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. To the next one, these are the words of the holy one, the true one, who has the keys of David, who, op who opens no one can shut, and who shuts no one can open. It's interesting how sometimes Jesus opens things in our lives and we still question him. Then there's other times when he'll shut things down for us and we wonder, 
why we're struggling when he shut the door, we're trying to open it again. And the last one, these are words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the, the beginning of God's creation. He's not saying he was created, he's saying he was there at the beginning of all creation. Let's keep on with where we're at. With. So this is a word of God. Jesus walking among the churches, speaking the word of God to the church. I kind of find that as a picture. The seven lampstands, these are seven churches. And I think these are just, this is particularly seven churches. But it's also something for us. And it's like Jesus is walking amongst the churches generally. Now I know there's only one church, the universal church, the big church. But also there's a local church, which is what we're part of. So Jesus was talking to the people, in amongst, walking around the churches, walking amongst the churches, but he was also speaking directly to the churches. And these are the seven churches. I've got to be careful. Coughing, sneezing, people panic. Getting itchy nose, it's all right. These are the seven churches. To Ephesians, this... Uh, <laughs> We've lost them already. <laughs> Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Typhida, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. These were actually seven local churches. They existed, they've been documented and they've been checked out. And this is a picture of roughly where they were. You've got the seven churches going out, we've got Ephesus here and it works its way round in like a big, I won't say circle, but in a circular way. You've got... Um, Obviously, Athens over here, put it on roads if you pass. This is Patmos right here. Thessalonica over here, which is where Thessalonians was wrote to. We've got Istanbul further up there. So this is the Mediterranean. This is Turkey. This is what people would say today as Turkey. So these were literally seven churches. And these seven churches did have the problems that we come across, that are written down. But it says this. In each of the letters, there's an interesting phrase. There's some parts to each of the letter, but in each letter there's this phrase, either as an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now this actually occurs seven more times, which wouldn't be surprising in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark and Luke, and then also later on in the book of Revelation. So 14 times this phrase, either as an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, or in the rest of the Bible, either as an ear, let him hear. Now, Question is, do you have an ear? Well, obviously you're listening to me, and whether people are deaf or not, they still have ears, and they need to hear what the Spirit is actually saying to the churches. So there were local churches, there were seven of them, and the question I asked last time is, why these seven churches? Why in particular these seven? Why not some of the other, other churches, some big churches, some other great churches? But he picked on these. When we looked at the map, we had Laodicea, Colossians wasn't, wasn't far from Laodicea. Why didn't he pick that church? He had to pick these deliberate churches because each of these churches had a problem that we can learn from. They also had a solution which we can learn from. But he also says, so there were local churches. That's the first application. The second application, he says, let me hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So each church could learn from the other church. Each of the seven churches could learn from a report that Jesus had given to one church what they could learn for themselves. At the end of the day, there's two ways of learning stuff. You either learn by your own mistakes or learn by somebody else's mistakes. And it's always a lot easier to learn by somebody else's mistakes than make the mistakes yourself. However, most of us don't learn from other people's mistakes. The third line of application is to us, the church, we can still learn through history what these seven churches got up to, what Jesus spoke to them, and how we can learn from that, especially in, the, in, in Ephesus and the church there. What we can learn from that, we'll look at later on. But it's interesting now, we can still learn even today. But there's a fourth application, and this is an interesting one, because some people argue about this and whether it's true or not. As I've looked through church history, it looks pretty true. The guy who actually started talking about this it was in about the 1500s when he noticed a pattern that was building up. That these seven churches are actually historical, not only in the sense they were there, but were prophetic moving forward. They actually outlined church history over the last 2,000 years. 
So one of the reasons I believe that Jesus picked these particular churches wasn't just because they had unique problems. I think other churches have some of the similar problems. But he picked these seven churches to outline church history right up to the present day. And we can learn so much from that. These seven churches, they were the Ephesus. It, it was in church history. We'd say that's the Apostolic Church. And there's the rough dates of it. Smyrna, the suffering church, the church actually, after the apostolic time, went into a time of great persecution, especially under the Romans. It's all in church history, and they suffered a lot. And then the church in Rome in particular, Rome legalised Christianity. And that meant it was okay to be a Christian, but then it adopted Christianity as its state religion. And that represents Pergamon, which is like, it means the church that married the state, when the church and the state become too close to each other. And then the church, Thyatira, the church of the Dark Ages, began about 590. Throughout the Dark Ages, we don't really know much, except for the church went into lots of quarrelling, lots of fighting. There was the Byzantine church, the Greek Orthodox church, there was lots of groups. This is the Catholic church, and we're not going to have a go at the Catholics. Because this isn't the Catholic of today and there is problems within the Catholic Church but there's also problems within some Protestant churches as well. But this is a dark age. This is when popes would rise up and if you could buy positions they did. It was about governments and leadership and, and trying to lead, um, own nations. And this is where the uh, Holy Roman Empire, which had nothing to do with Rome, um, started to come through. And you can look at that throughout church history. When I did my study in church history, it was one thing I really didn't like, but I've learned so much from it. Then the church went into Sardis, the Church of the Reformation. Martin Luther is one of the leading men there, but there are other people around. We need to remember that as much as the church went through the Dark Ages, God was still moving in the church. People were still getting saved. People were still being set free. The church was still growing. And then we come to the, the Reformation where it seems to take a big jump forward. And that led into what is the Philadelphia time, which is the missionary church. And that's when we start sending missionaries, especially from England, around the world. And other countries did the same. We took the, the gospel around the world and we reached thousands of people. And the church was on the move. Then we get to Laodicea and it's the lukewarm church. And that began about 1900. Also, there's a time roughly after that when the Pentecostal movement started, charismatic movement started some time after that, and lots of different things have gone on. But as a whole, you could say that the church is very lukewarm compared to where it once was. And even as you go through these things, you've got to understand that God is always moving, God is always encouraging his building, and he wants the church to be passionate and not lukewarm towards him. And yet today we see a very lukewarm church. What were these churches actually known for? Ephesus is actually known for a defender of the doctrine. But that led to being very legalistic. Some of the churches even today are very similar. That they stand very tight on their doctrine. And so become legalistic and grace is not really in there. You know, Smyrna was a church that would suffer a lot of persecution. More than the average church at that time. And then it went on. Pergamon... It was a liberal church, and it needed to repent, says Jesus. It just it became very liberal, which is what we see today in some areas. Typhide was a corrupt church, and it had a false had a false prophetess. There's many churches that claim to have prophets and prophetess around, but they're false. There's been many groups that stood up in the name of Christianity, and yet they are false prophets, cults almost, and yet. They're still on the fringe of the, the Christianity. They're still on the fringes of what is the church. There's a group not far away here that don't acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Saviour, but they're going about the Father, God, Father, God, they say, not knowing that Jesus is actually the face of God. Sardis, a dead church, that needed to wake up. That's what it was known as. Philadelphia be a life church that would endure patiently, that had endured patiently. And laid to see a being different church with a lukewarm faith. And even today, through those seven churches, we can see glimmers of, of local churches. Maybe your church, maybe my church. We 
of these different things. Are we indifferent? Have we become lukewarm? Are we dead? And we need to wake up. Are we alive? We'd all claim that we are alive. But it's not what we claim, it's what Jesus thinks about us that really matters. So we're going to be looking at Ephesus. So Revelation chapter 2, and it starts off with this. To the church in Ephesus, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks amongst the seven golden lampstands. Now, Ephesus is an amazing church. It had a great foundation. I mean, Paul spent three years there in Ephesus. I mean, if you're going to have Paul around there for a while, three years. I mean, he only spent weeks in other churches, but in this one he spent three years there. Timothy became one of its pastors. And John, after the revelation, actually retired there. He went there and actually spent the rest of his life there and, and died there. These are some, you know, these... This is a church that was amazing. It actually had a great foundation. And Ephesus actually is an interesting place. You can still visit today. You know, it's all ruined now, it's Ephesus. But there's no church there. Well, later on we'll find out where Jesus said, if you don't repent, I'll remove your lampstand. It might have happened. Ephesus was also, it means the desired one. It means darling. I mean, this is almost like... Look at Jesus' title and what he's going to say to the church. Ephesus meant darling, desired one. It was also known as the Queen of Asia. It was a beautiful city. It had a, you know, the, the primary religion was to Artemis, or later became Diana. And it was very sex-orientated, very much. Um, there was many brothels there and the temple had prostitutes. And um, Jesus actually, you know, he actually calls it his desire. When he loved this church, he cared for his church. Jesus is the one who's actually walking amongst the churches. John, actually, and Timothy and Mary all had their graves there, their tombs there. So they were buried there after they died. And actually, John not only wrote Revelation with this letter to it, one John, many believe is actually... John's letter to the church at Ephesus. Paul wrote an amazing letter to the church in Ephesus. And actually in Acts, uh, we, talk, we hear about Paul being in Ephesus. It's all going on in Ephesus. It, it was a very large church. An amazing church, in fact. A huge church. It met lots of our churches. It looked so small. And yet it met there and it was in a major place. Ephesus itself is not really, it died out because of the arbor just got silted up. The Romans cut down all the trees that was around in that area. Excuse me. And uh, the, the river then started flowing into the harbour and the harbour just silted up. So nowadays it's, it's five, six miles in land. It's Ephesus. But you can still visit it if you get a chance. But then Jesus says this. He says, I know your works. I do like that because Jesus knows your works and he knows my works. And this isn't in a negative sense. He knows what we do. He knows what we're doing for him. And it continues. I know your works, your toil and your patience endurance. And how you cannot bear those who are evil. But you have tested them who call themselves apostles but are not. And have found them false. He says that you, know, you cannot tolerate those who are evil. You can't bear with me, he said in this version. You cannot bear with those who are evil. This is talking about not people in the world. It's not talking about those out there. This is talking about people that are coming to the church and they're in the church for a while and all they're trying to do is infiltrate the church but we're trying to get in there and get into a position. These are evil people, the Bible says, and yet he said they couldn't tolerate them, they couldn't bear with them. In fact, he said that they would call themselves apostles or not and you have found them false. In other words, they tested them, they checked them out, they just didn't take them for one. I mean, how many people walk into our church who have got a gift? You know, I've got a talent, and we think, this is amazing, this answer to prayer. But the church in Ephesus actually tested everybody. They checked everybody out. We'll find out why shortly. He says, I know, you're, uh, I know you have endured patiently, and, bear, and have bared up for my name's sake, yet you have not grown weary. It's interesting that even today there are many people, when questioned about Jesus, we almost deny him. People say to me, don't put 
Don't talk about Jesus on Facebook or other social platforms. Don't tell people so openly about Jesus. But he says, I know that you have endured patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. They stood up for Jesus' name. They stood up there and have not grown weary. They didn't give in. They just stood their ground. So this is what Jesus is saying. I know your deeds. I know your hard work. I know you've persevered. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, but you test them. That you have persevered, that you have endured, that you have not grown with... I mean, I'm depressed. This is amazing. Like, I mean, if Jesus came to any church and said these things, we'd think we're doing really well. We'd think, but this is amazing. We're on top of it all here. Because this is what Jesus is saying to us. But the, the reason why that they would test people, the reason why they did hard work, the reason why they persevered, is because if you remember in Acts, I'll, I'll bring it up, in Acts 20, this is Paul. Paul had been travelling around, and he's heading back towards Jerusalem at this point, and he, he sent messages to those in, in Ephesus to come and meet him, and they came down to meet him, and they had a talk, and this is part of the talk that he had with them. He said, keep a watch over yourselves, and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has giving you oversight. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he has bought with his own blood. I know, says Paul, that after I leave, savage wolves will come in amongst you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples for themselves. So be on your guard. Remember, for, for these three years, I have never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Paul had warned them and said to them, people are going to rise up, people are going to come in, people are going to actually try to infiltrate the church, be on your guard, and they've done really well, they guarded the doctrines, they stood up for what they believed in, they held fast to the word of God, and they'd actually tested things. I mean, Paul spent three years in this church, Timothy pastored this church, Paul wrote back to this church, John wrote to this church, Mary was in the church. John actually died in the church. And so it's a great church, a great church of foundation and a solid church on the word of God. The only problem is they came so standing on the word and I'm all for the word of God. I'm all for standing on the word of God. They stood on the word of God to the letter of the law almost and became very legalistic because Jesus went on to say this. He said, but I have this against you. I mean, after all that good things that have been said, but I have this against you. You have abandoned your first love. Other versions put it this way. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. It almost implies like two lovers separating, divorce. That one has walked away from the other, leaving one hurt and abandoned. Jesus is saying, but I have this against you. You've abandoned the love that you had at first. You've left things behind. They'd actually become so busy doing things for God, they'd forgotten who they were doing them for. They'd become so passionate about holding up the truth, they forgot the one who is a truth giver. They, they became so defensive over holding on to tradition and standing on the things of the word of God to the point of becoming legalistic instead of, oh, that pops up again, instead of just trusting in the things of God. They'd forgotten who they were doing them for. Jeremiah actually says something really amazing. He says, this is what the Lord says. I remember how eager you were to please me. I was a young bride long ago. How you loved me and followed me, even through the barren wasteland. Is that a picture of you and I? Do you remember where you've come from? Do you remember the passion that you you had is it the same as what you first had the love you had for God you know how you felt about God when he first saved you the love you had for the word for the for prayer for the church for worship even is it the same as what it was or did it kind of faded a little bit you know when when you first came to Jesus that passion that you had is it still there now because this is Jeremiah he said, I remember how eager you were to please me. For some of you, it might be so long ago. But for others, it may not be so long ago. Remember, therefore, 
from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. Jesus is saying we need to remember where we've come from. The word repent actually means to return to the top penthouse, return back to the top to your position, return to where you come, turn your mind, you know, turn away from something, change your mind about it, and do the works you once did. Now, when it says do the works you once did, I know that we can think, well, what's it really talking about? Is it about doing? It is about doing, it's about remembering what we once did. When you first got saved, you didn't do the things you did do, you did it because you loved God. You didn't do it because you had to do it. I mean, when I first got saved, they couldn't keep me out of the church. Can't keep me out of the church now, but for many people who get saved, and church is such, it's life, it's amazing. They're there morning and evening, they're there at the Bible study, they're even the prayer meeting. But then as the years go by, other things just creep in and suddenly it becomes almost an optional extra. Remember, therefore, from where you are fallen. Remember what you were like when you first got saved. And are you there? If, you, if you're not at that point, then the Bible tells us to repent. Now, there are some Christians that say we don't have to repent. You know, once you've got saved, you've got saved. You have to. This isn't talking about salvation. This is talking about your relationship with God. And do the works you did at first. What did you used to do? I believe that most people never have a problem reading the Bible once they fall in love with Jesus. Then sometimes it can become an odd thing as they go on. You know, we'll we'll just carry on and, and work as we're through this. This is what um, Jesus then continues. So if well, I'll just run it back one. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent to do the things, the works you did at first. If not, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Interesting that the church is no longer there. It is interesting. Yet you have these things, yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which also hate. Notice it's not them, it doesn't hate the people, it hates the works of these people. Now, the Nicolaitans, we'll get into it later on, but many believe it's a sect that was started up by Nicholas, which is one of the seven deacons that came out in Acts 6, verse 5. I would believe that actually he set up something and he got so much into grace that they forgot what they had to do and what they should be doing. But we'll look at that later. Did they repent? Interesting question. Well, go look, where is the church today? Well, there's no church in Ephesus. Ephesus is a city that exists. So they didn't repent. So Jesus took away the lampstand. It's interesting that Jesus says, I will take away your lampstand. You see, the devil cannot stop the church, according to Matthew 16, 18. He says, you know, even gates available will not prevail against the church. But Jesus can remove the church because he's in charge of the church. And then to this verse again, this is at the end, but we've already looked at this, he says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Are we listening to our first love? Are we listening to what the Spirit says to the churches? Or are we just carry on doing the, doing the work or doing the works of what we think we should and should do? Are we listening to our first love? Have we got our ears open to him and not just doing things for the sake of this is the start of a slide for these seven churches. As we pattern the seven churches, as we line them up, we'll find out that the first church started with, nevertheless, I hold this against you. You have let your first love. And by the seventh church, we get to this, you are lukewarm, and I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. That's talking about the church. This is Jesus. This is, this is after the resurrection and ascension. Is at the right hand of the Father. And these are the messages from Jesus in our time. Yes, written 1900 years ago, but they're for us today. But even the church of today, we can start off so well, but we need to be careful that we don't become lukewarm and get spat out of the mouth of God. It's horrendous. Jesus would have, he says, I'd rather be hot or cold. I'd rather be for grace or for the law. Not some mixture, a, a mishmash, lukewarm, you know, indifferent. It's interesting at this time 
when things are going on around the world that many Christians are just indifferent. There's no difference between Christians and the non-Christians at the moment in many places. And yet there should be a distinct difference between us. You know, did the church repent? No, it didn't. And God, Jesus removed its lampstand. And we need to have an ear that's listening to what the Spirit is saying to us. We need to be listening so we don't drift from, I have this one thing against you. We turn to me and we do. Yet if we don't, we end up to the point where we become lukewarm. And this is interesting. After Eva has an ear, we find this. To the one who overcomes, or to the one who conquers, I will grant him to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You see, before we talk about works, and works have nothing to do with salvation, but when you're saved and you're going for God, you will do works, and you will be rewarded for them at a later time. But it says, to the one who conquers, or to the one who overcomes, that I will grant him to eat from the tree of life. Another version, the King James, New King James says this, to him who overcomes, I will give him, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. If you remember in Genesis, right at the beginning, Adam and Eve had the tree of life there in their midst, but they never chose to eat from that tree. In fact, they ate from a tree that God told them not to eat from. And yet as believers, you know, if we overcome, he's going to give us a right to eat from the tree of life. Now we need to be careful here because I've just said to them, if we overcome, but he says, to the one that overcomes. Now we need to look at who is the overcomer. If we jump over to 1 John 5, verse 3 to 5, it says this, For this is love of, this is the love of God, that we keep his commands. And this is a command, and, sorry, and his commands are not burdensome. Well, he only actually really told us one command to love one another. For whatever, whoever is born of God overcomes the world. That's you and I. If you're saved, you have overcome the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes in Jesus is the Son of God. If you believe in Jesus, if you're Son of God, if you've given your life over to God, if you, in instance, God say whatever terminology you want to use there, you are the one who overcomes the world. And if you've overcome the world, then you get to the right to eat from the tree of life that's in the paradise of God. You're saved. You're just going to keep walking, keep going on, and keep strong for God. But what we learn from the church in Ephesus is that we need to make sure we don't become lukewarm. That we don't become passive and indifferent. Like, they lost their first love, sorry. Sorry, I'm jumping on to next. Some of us do. They lost their first love. They become so busy on doctrine. They'd have everything right. But Jesus has something more for them. He wanted relationships. See, Jesus doesn't want any of us to have religion. He wants us to have a relationship with him. And that's a, the great thing about Christianity, is that even today where we are in our lives, Jesus is still holding his hand out saying, I'm here for you. Whatever you're going through, he's here for you. And he wants your first love to be him. That doesn't mean we can't love our wives and children and our husbands in, in other cases, of other, other ladies. He doesn't say you can't love your loved ones, but he said he wants to be at the top of the list. He wants to be the number one in your life that you love first. He wants to be the chief of all things because he loves you so much. You're the apple of his eye. You're the great desire. Ephesus, the queen of Asia, the beautiful desired city. As you run for us, Jesus, he looks at us as his desired one. He looks to us as the one that he loves. And he remembers how passionate you were and I were right at the beginning. He remembers when we first got saved and we were so thankful. But time's just wearied on for us. And he says, don't give up, keep going. Stir your hearts up. Remember your first love and the heights from which you have fallen. Guys, if you're not as passionate for Jesus as you once were, I'm not saying you're backsliding away from God, but I'm going to say that you've allowed things to creep in. You've allowed other things to come in to the way between you and God. When a couple first get married, it's, it's romance and roses, it seems. But then as time goes on, there's ups and downs. And they've got to work things through. Jesus is the perfect husband for the church. It's not him who's having the ups and downs. It's a bride that's having the ups and downs. It's you and I that's having the ups and downs. But he's always faithful and true. He is the one who stands there and will always be there. 
And he's the one who can take us through this situation. He can walk us through life. And he says, walk with me. Stand with me. And we'll be okay. So wherever you are at, wherever you're doing, wherever you're going, stir up your hearts. I believe that some people need to get back into the Word of God. Some people need to stir up your prayer life. Some people just really need to fall back in love with Jesus. It's easy to read your Bible. It's easy to pray. It's easy to worship. It's easy to be amongst believers and Christians, maybe not so much at this time. It's easy, you know, to be following Jesus when you're in love with him. It's when that love goes cold that everything else just becomes a burden. And the only command Jesus actually told us to do, really, is that we love one another. And how do we demonstrate our love for God? It's by loving one another. And how do we demonstrate our love for one another? By our service that we do. Why do we serve other people? Because we love God first. And that's the way it should be for us all. So let me encourage you to stir up your hearts. You might be kind of on fire, passionate for Jesus. Well, good for you. Keep going. But for those who are just weighing it down a little bit, life's just got to you. I'm not saying you're backslidden. You're not away from God. You just need to put him back in first place. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for everyone listening to this recording. I pray right now that you will bless them. Lord, that you'll uplift them, and especially this time, you'll keep them safe. Lord, open our eyes and our ears to hear what you're saying through the book of Revelation, that we may discover more and amazing things about you, your character, and the church, at, Lord, what we're up to. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you're doing. Amen.